Good morning. morning. How are you? That was fantastic, wasn't it? How many of you go to church, by the way? Do you? It's interesting, isn't it? (laughs) I I was um, brought up in Liverpool, and uh, my brother's here now. There are seven of us in the family. And uh, we used to go to church in a place called the Four Square Temple, which was just up the street from where we lived. And the reason we went there, it was the nearest church to our house. That was the extent of our theological commitment. It was the the nearest church to the house. And we thought, why would we go past that church to go to another one? It's like going past Tesco's to get to Waitrose, we thought. And I used to go there... uh, I say there were seven of us, um, but uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was extraordinarily cute. <laughs> it's hard to convey this, really. Um, uh, until I was four, what? Thank you, man. Thank you. Remember that was meant to be quicker. Do you remember? Half price if you're late. Um, Now, till I was four, uh, my dad was convinced that I was going to be a football player. Uh, In fact, my brother John, who's here right now, became a football player, and so did my brother Neil. They were both taken on by Everton. And um, but until I was four, I was uh, I was the fit one. Actually, you weren't born at the time, so it it, it did give me an advantage, I have to say. But. uh, small genetic head start (laughs) and then uh, you know my dad used to take me to the park and um, and I would find my way home eventually (laughs) the law was different then and and eventually uh, he was convinced that I was the one I was very fast uh, muscular very attractive as a child and and then in 1954, there was this polio epidemic. Do you remember it, anybody? Major epidemic. You can read all about it. And uh, I got it. I got polio at the age of four. And that pretty much put an end to my career with Everton. As I couldn't walk properly and was uh, actually paralysed for eight months. So it, say, it ruled out my chance of getting in the team. It wouldn't now, by the way. I think... Uh, <laughs> I think there'd be some excitement if I were to put my name forward for Everton at the moment. (laughs) But my dad was, you know, obviously uh, devastated, as was my mother, you know. um, And, I mean, I recovered, you know, I was in hospital for eight months, and then, uh, and I recovered, and I came out of hospital looking extremely cute. (laughs) I was wearing two calipers, I I had a wheelchair, crutches, Long curly hair, blonde hair, and a lisp. Come on. (laughs) Really. People approach me spontaneously in the street to give me money. (laughs) They did. I was I was I was that cute. And in fact, my brother and I used to exploit that, not John, but my brother Ian and I, uh, by mingling among the football crowds in Liverpool, where I would strategically fall over in front of somebody which would double the donation, normally. (laughs) Ian has yet to pay me my part, actually, of this (laughs) this particular scam. Uh, But we used to go to the church, and uh, it was the Four Square Temple, which turns out to be um, an American evangelical church, if you look it up. And it was actually in the old Methodist chapel in our street. But it was founded by a woman called Amy Semple McPherson. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. You should check her out if you haven't. She was a, a, one of the first superstar evangelicals. She was American, and uh, she used to fill her church every Sunday three times a day with about 3,000 people. And, I mean, all the old movie stars went to see her, and she sent out these missionaries across the planet to bring the Foursquare gospel 
to underprivileged families all around the world. Uh, and one of them turned up in our street, which is why we went there, rather than to Tesco's. <laughs> and I used to like going. Uh, we used to have, uh, they eventually let, let, I stayed on when my brother stopped going because I couldn't have a good reason not to. And I didn't like to let people down. You know, and I got on with them all right. And they let me take communion, a sort of communion, you know, a, an evangelical type communion. Uh, we used to ha they didn't have wine. You know, if you're, if you're a Catholic, some of you might have been born Catholics, if you go to communion, you can often get a decent claret. <laughs> Do you know, it's worth turning up. You know, you might get a decent vintage. Uh, just a tip, don't gulp all of it. That's just a thought, you know. It, tends to disaffect the congregation if you finish the entire cup, but <laughs> hang on to the priest begging for more of it. It's not, not a good sign. <laughs> not a clear signal you, of your redemption, frankly. But, um, and also, uh, in place, uh, so we didn't have uh, red wine, we had Ribena. <laughs> and in place of uh, unleavened bread, we had Nimble. Little squares of nimble, white nimble bread. So I formed, you know, a pretty dim view of the Saviour's constitution as a child, frankly. You know, take this, this is my blood. Really? <laughs> this is my body, are you certain? You, know. <laughs> you need help, that's all I can tell you. You, know. you need urgent medical attendance. But uh, I kept going anyway, and eventually we moved from the area, and I stopped going. But I kept going because I didn't want to let them down. Uh, but it became a bit of a drag after a while. The turning point for me was when I was told, I had a chat with one of the, uh, the teachers in the class in Sunday school, and she got to the point where she said that um, if you're not saved, you won't go to heaven. If you don't go to church, you won't go to heaven. I said, really? And I was desperately trying to be saved. You know, as a kid, you know, you're lying in bed. Because I was told all I had to do was ask. So I kept asking, and um, the line was engaged, as far, as far as I could tell. But the turning point was that I said, well, hang on, I had this thought, I thought, hang on, my dad doesn't go to church. Is he going to heaven? And I remember the teacher fumbled for a bit, you know, came out with a form of words. Uh, and I said, yes, yes, but, I mean, there were a lot of conditional clauses in there. And even at the age of 11, I was suspicious of, you know, of the subjunctive. So, so I said, yeah, but is he going or not? And she said, well, if he doesn't go to church, if he's not saved, no, he won't go to heaven. I said, and therefore, what? <laughs> so we'll go to hell, she said, you know, after the, you know, the long night had worn on at this point. But, um, so I made up my mind at that point. I thought, well, this is either nonsense or I'm going with him. <laughs> If it's good enough for him, I, I want to be there, you know, frankly. Now, I would like to say that my views on religion have matured beyond this point. They haven't, frankly. <laughs> they haven't. And, which is not to say I do not have a deep interest in spiritual things, which I do, but I've always been, myself, uh, at a distance from organised religions. I don't, I'm not recommending that, I'm just saying this was the case. But, what happened was that uh, some years later, my mum ran into this teacher in the street. Uh, I mean, she wasn't driving a car at the time. She was just <laughs> <laughs> took her some time to pinpoint her in the middle of the road, but she got her anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't easy. No, but uh, she ran into her and she said, uh, this, this, uh, she's a great woman actually, she said to my mum, uh, how's your Kenneth doing? And she said, it was great, actually. I was teaching at the University of Warwick at the time. And she said, he's great. He's uh, teaching at Warwick University. And she said, you know, he was always a great inspiration to us. And my mum said, who? Our oh, Kenneth. <laughs> we got the right one. And uh, she said, yes. He said, because he kept coming to the church every Sunday. We'd see him struggling down the street in Liverpool on his crutches. And uh, there were months there where we thought we'd have to close the church because of the, slow, uh, the low congregations. And it was the sight of him turning up every week that kept the place open. And I thought, how ironic is that? Because I was lying in bed of a night praying for it to close. <laughs> and I've never quite got over this idea 
that we are all, to some degrees, the author of our own fate. <laughs> and if we'd only look around properly, we could reconstruct situations uh, that we feel we're the victim of, but which we're actually personally creating. And I think this is true in a spiritual sense as well. And um, some, uh, well, last year, a uh, year and a half ago, uh, do you care when this was? <laughs> How important is it to you that I get this date right? I mean, <laughs> I can Google it now if, if it matters. <laughs> Take my word for it, this happened. <laughs> September of 2009. Uh, Terry, my wife, and I is here today. Uh, we're at the... There's a fantastic event called the Vancouver Peace Summit. And uh, the Peace Summit was uh, for about 2,000 people. It was organized by the Dalai Lama Center in Vancouver. And I had to moderate the opening session. There were, I say, about 2,000 people there. And the panel was amazing. Uh, it was Pierre Omidyar. Do you know him? He's the founder of eBay, which was a good idea, <laughs> wasn't it? I was really close. I had D-Bay, you know, <laughs> like that close. But Pierre got eBay and uh, Matthew Ricard, do you know of him? He's a, a, a French, originally a French cell biologist. Well, he was originally a baby, but originally, <laughs> if I'm being honest, but he became a French cell but he, he became a Tibetan monk. His father was a philosopher, and he said, they used to have all these people come into the house all the time when he was a kid. He was a very prominent philosopher, his father. And he said, you know, we had Samuel Beckett come to the house, and Albert Camus. Well, this great raft of French intellectuals used to come to the house and have dinner with them. And he said it was heady, you know. Um, they had Jean-Paul Sartre came and um, Simon de Beauvoir. He said, we were in the thick of... French intellectual life. And as a kid, he was invited to join the tables. He said, but he realized there was something about it that never quite struck him until he saw a, a, a film or a news report of some Tibetan monks who'd shown up in Paris. And he said they looked incandescently happy. He said it was like seeing some of the prophets you know, come back from ancient times and you know, sitting over their robes and long hair. And he said they were exuding this sense of happiness. He said, whereas all these intellectuals that come into the house were as neurotic as you could imagine anybody could be. <laughs> you know, they were the smartest people in the Western tradition, but they looked completely racked with uncertainty and anxiety <laughs> and smoking themselves to death and you know, drinking vast amounts of booze uh, and you know, pronouncing on the principles of a good life. And he said, I wasn't completely inclined to their view, frankly. So he went off to Tibet and, and joined a monastery and he's been a monk now for over 30 years and he's been... Uh, a close associate of the Dalai Lama, and also he was, uh, he's taken part in all kinds of research into the effects of meditation on the brain. You know, the Dalai Lama is actually very interested in the science of meditation. Uh, so Matthew Ricard is uh, Mathieu, do the French for you, uh, Mathieu is uh, officially recognized now as the happiest person on earth. <laughs> Honestly, that must be a burden, mustn't it, socially? Mustn't it? You can't show up anywhere and be miserable. You know, if I, people get you under the Trace Description Act. I mean, what's this? You know, <laughs> yeah, run it down in the street and you have to smile and say, "This is great." I'm gonna say, "This is great." Uh, Umfo Tutu, who's Desmond Tutu's daughter, who's living in his tradition. She's also uh, a cleric in South Africa, doing wonderful work, particularly with women in South Africa. Um, Eckhart Tolle on the platform. You know his work. He wrote a book called The Power of Now. Fantastic book. Um, so that was the panel, plus the Dalai Lama. That's the panel. And I'm having to moderate <laughs> this conversation and introduce it. Uh, one of my first problems was I had to introduce the Dalai Lama. You know, I mean, Morgan th thought she had a problem introducing me. You know, but frankly, <laughs> it's a pushover. Uh, I thought, what do you say about the Dalai Lama? And then I thought, actually, I don't need to say anything, do I? Because anybody whose name starts with the... <laughs> <laughs> You're home and dry, aren't you, really, frankly? <laughs> if you've managed to sneak the definite article into your name, I think, frankly... You know. 
which Dalai Lama will I be introducing? <laughs> that would be the Dalai Lama. <laughs> anyway, we had this... Uh, the session was called World Peace Through Personal Peace. That was the theme. We had 2,000 people and an hour to sort this one out. And... Uh, <laughs> So we were just killing time for the final 20 minutes, frankly. You know. <laughs> what should we talk about now, having sorted that one out? And, but the Dalai Lama said lots of wonderful things. He, he does. Uh, one of the things that happened, he said, uh, somebody asked him a question, not in the session I was moderating, but the one that followed it, but uh, it was being moderated by Mary Robinson. All the sessions were moderated by people called Robinson. It didn't really matter. <laughs> that was the only qualification. And... Uh, <laughs> He's working his way through the alphabet at the moment. He'll retire in about five years' time when we get to X's. But, the, but somebody asked him a question. Uh, and Mary Robinson said, Your Holiness, you know, what do you think of this? And he thought, you know, from, from, for about a minute, you know, he kind of leant forward. We all mentally leant forward towards him, all 2,000 of us, thinking this is going to be great. <laughs> it's the Dalai Lama, you know. She asked him this question, and he paused. And we waited for what we know is going to be something sensational. And, and then he said, I don't know. <laughs> well, we were taken aback. You know, we thought, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, you're, <laughs> you're the Dalai Lama. I mean, we don't know. <laughs> but you're supposed to know. Well, what was wonderful about it was it was a real moment of permission for the whole room. Because his point was, and he talked a bit about it later on, is that he said, what he said was, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. And his point was that he, he doesn't want to say he knows things he doesn't know. I just haven't thought about it. Now, I've thought about a lot of stuff. Not that. I was on a panel later on with him, uh, with uh, a physicist um, who won the Nobel Prize. And he, he, he was talking, in the briefing, he was speaking to Mathieu. And he said, you know, what would the Dalai Lama think of Pascal? And Matthew said he wouldn't know anything about Pascal. You know, he's, he's the world's, one of the world's leading scholars of Buddhism. He doesn't claim to know everything in the Western philosophical tradition or Western literature. And I just thought it was wonderful of him to say, I don't know. Because in our culture, not to know is to be at fault socially, isn't it? You, people pretend to know lots of things they don't know. Because to, the worst thing you can do is appear to be uninformed about something, to not have an opinion. You know, and our news media fuel that idea. You know, they bring people on for instant opinions about things they don't know anything about. And I feel this particularly because I work a lot in education. And education is filled with people politically who pronounce on education who know nothing about it. I can think of one example as we speak. <laughs> um, Michael Gove, I'm thinking of, by the way, in case anybody's... <laughs> actually wondering what I'm talking about. So I think that's important, that we should know the limits of our knowledge and understand what we don't know and be willing to explore things we don't know without feeling embarrassed at not knowing about it. But he also said something very interesting, uh, which connected to some work John, my brother's doing. John is putting together our family tree at the moment in Liverpool. It's one of the differences. We were born into a big working class family in Liverpool. And one of the differences, I think, between working class families and middle class families of long standing, is that for the mo or upper middle class or aristocratic families in this country, is that people um, from working class backgrounds often know nothing about their own origins. They don't know much more than two generations back. They might know their great grandfathers. Do you agree with me? You know, whereas you, you go to country houses and, and their ancestors are on the wall and people are brought up knowing where they came from, or some version of it anyway. And there's a big thing now. People are trying to check out their ancestry, and John's doing it for us. So he's putting together our family tree. Uh, it's not much of a tree, really. It's more like a shrub <laughs> with a curious blight in the roots <laughs> down there. But he found some, something very interesting, which was that seven of our eight great-grandparents, you have eight, seven of them were all born in the middle of the 19th century within two miles of each other in the same part of Liverpool, the same parish. That's how they met. I mean, that's my version of how they met. I mean, you might take a different view and say, no, 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 the cosmos. Yeah. So arrange things. 
that these eight soulmates would converge in the same point in the space-time continuum and meet each other and fall in love and continue the process that led to me being here. That's one version of it. That's a possible reading. It's not the one I'm inclined to. I think people just had lower standards then, frankly. You know, I think <laughs> people, people ran into each other in the street and thought, you'll do. <laughs> frankly, you know, this, this is not too embarrassing. I could spend my life with you without feeling socially ostracised. I don't think they were less happy for it either, by the way, but they weren't besieged by images on the internet, you know, or TMZ, you know, or Hello! magazine. You know, they didn't know that Angelina Jolie was an option, really, and, you know, <laughs> or waiting for Brad Pitt to show up in the shop. You know, there's no, you'll do. And the thing is, what something that Dan Arma said was this, that if you think about your lineage, your, I mean, your personal lineage, you sitting here now, um, if you think of the number of people who had to meet each other down the centuries uh, and the circumstances had to come about for them to meet each other, however they did that, however they bumped into each other, um, how many people had to do that in how many different circumstances and how many different settings uh, through the long march of time till eventually your parents met and under whatever circumstances you were then conceived and then now here you are, the Dalai Lama's point is to be born at all is a miracle. It's a miracle that we're here. And congratulations, by the way. You, know, you made it where billions didn't. But here you are, and you've made it. And you're not here for long. You know, with, with the following wind, you've got probably 90-odd years, which is the blink of an eye in cosmic terms. And his comment was simply... He didn't say this in Vancouver, he said it in a, in, a, in a book he was writing about meditation, but he said, to be born at all is a miracle. So what are you going to do with this life? Now that you have it, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to waste it? Are you going to do something interesting with it? Are you going to do something that matters to you or, or not? And this to me is where this idea of passion comes in. I published a book uh, last year, I think you've got a copy of it now, haven't you? Have you paid for it? <laughs> I don't see why I should summarise it if you haven't paid for it, frankly, but, <laughs> but... Who has paid for it? I'll talk to you privately later on. But... <laughs> OK, yeah. Come on, we'll go to the pump. No. <laughs> One thing that struck me for a long time is that very many people, very many people, I'm not saying this is true of you, I don't know, you know, but you'll know if it's true, or you'll know if it's true of people you know, but very many people spend their entire lives doing things they don't really care for. They just get through the week, one way or another. They you know, endure their lives and wait for the weekend. Um, with no real sense of fulfilment, a kind of general sense of tolerance for it, or not. And if you want evidence for that, you've only got to look at the annual receipts of the pharmaceutical companies and the brewing companies. Uh, you only have to look at the levels of crime and, and of uh, disengagement. I think of this as the, the other climate crisis. You know, we've become used to the idea that there is a crisis in the world's natural resources. There is. I mean, we needn't go into that now, but there was a, a group of geologists published a report two years ago. I mean, senior, well-respected geologists. And they refer now, they believe that for the past 200 years, geologically, the planet is in a new period uh, called the Anthropocene. Um, and they say that geologists would recognise in the geological record a distinct and new phase since the last ice age. If you just look at the geological record. Uh, they mean, for the first time in history, a geological age which has been caused by the activities of human beings, the Anthropocene. And he said you can see that in carbon deposits, in the, uh, the extinction of species, in the uh, changing... A constitution of the oceans and of the atmosphere. Human beings have made an indelible geological imprint on the planet. And, you know, we don't know, frankly, what the outcome of this is likely to be. But I think there's another climate crisis, which is a crisis which is connected to it of human resources as opposed to natural resources, or in addition to natural resources. What I mean is that most people have no idea what they're capable of. No real sense of their talents or their abilities. And many, very many people therefore conclude they don't have any. You know, there's nothing special about them. 
And my conviction has always been to the contrary, that we're all born with deep talents and abilities. It, if you're a human being, it comes with a kit. Um, I'm convinced that the most distinctive feature of, of human life is this power of imagination. I don't know how many of you have got animals or dogs, but um, including dogs, I guess. In case you think I don't know what an animal is. <laughs> animals or dogs. But if you take a small baby into the garden, preferably one that you know, <laughs> and, with, with the permission of whoever the parent is, if you run away with a small baby and <laughs> at night and point at the moon, the baby will look at the moon. If you take your dog into the garden and point at the moon, the dog will look at your finger <laughs> with an expression of irritation in all probability. <laughs> and the difference is that human beings are born with expansive imaginations and a sense of reference and possibility. We get that. We get that you can mean things. You know, biologically, we're probably evolving at the same rate as every other species on Earth. But culturally, we're in a completely different category. Uh, I mean, if you have a dog, you know that culturally, they're not changing much, are they? Are they? Not really. I mean, if you, you, don't, you don't have to keep checking in with dogs, do you, to see what's new? You know. like, <laughs> What's the latest thing with you people? You know, uh, what are you up to now? Pretty much what we're always doing, honestly. Is, uh, <laughs> would you excuse me while I urinate on this tree? <laughs> We've got past that, haven't we, on the whole? Well, speaking personally, I can say. <laughs> but with human beings, there's always something new. We're always on to something. Because we have not just this power of imagination, but what flows from it, which is the power of creativity. The ability to produce things, to make things, to make new things. And we're all born with that. Like we're born with the power of language and, uh, and the power of thought. It comes with the kit. But some people discover their unique and individual abilities and some don't. And those who don't often conclude they don't have any. Um, the, the, I also meet people who absolutely have found what they think is their natural place, they, their natural talents. And they love what they do and the lives that flow from it. They are to use that expression, they're in their element. To be in the element, it, being in your element is two things, at least. One of them is you're doing something for which you have a natural capacity. Now, you get it. One of the people uh, I include in the book is a guy called Terence Tao, and I mention him because he's uh, particularly gifted in something I'm not good at, which is mathematics. Uh, Terence is a mathematician. He works at UCLA in, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, when I say he's a mathematician, he's actually probably the most accomplished mathematician on the planet. He's known as the Mozart of math. There's no S in mathematics in America, as you know. Uh, you'd think it would be plural since it was mathematics, wouldn't you? But anyway, Terence, uh, when he was three, taught himself to read by watching Sesame Street. So he has a rather curious accent. <laughs> anyway, that's a consequence. <laughs> At the age of Four, he was doing double-digit equations, which I still can't do. At the age of eight, he took a college entrance math exam and got 98%. At the age of 20, he got his PhD in pure mathematics. And at the age of 30, he was awarded the Fields Medal for Mathematics, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. It's reasonable to say, isn't it, that Terence gets math. <laughs> I think Terence has got the hang of this, frankly. He has a natural aptitude for it. Uh, Somebody else I include in the book uh, was a woman called Ava Lawrence. I don't know if you've heard of Ava Lawrence. Ava Lawrence, I met her on a plane. And uh, I don't think I've told Terry about this yet, but uh, anyway. <laughs> but as we're in a public place, I feel fairly secure now. To... <laughs> and it helps to talk, doesn't it? <laughs> Actually, truthfully, I never speak to people on aeroplanes. I fly a lot and I never speak to people on aeroplanes if I can possibly avoid it. Because you get trapped. You know what I mean? You're on a, fl a plane for six hours and you get trapped at, you know, it, with a perfect stranger. That, and it may or may not be interesting. And what if it's not? You know, I mean, I don't mind talking to people when the plane lands. <laughs> when we're taxiing to the terminal. I would much rather regret the six-hour conversation we didn't have. 
just me, than the one I have to put up with. I was on a flight uh, a year or so ago to Hong Kong from Los Angeles, and it's a 14-hour flight. And as the plane was boarding, they hadn't closed the door yet. The guy next to me, you could tell he was bursting for a conversation. You, know, you can tell people fidget, don't they? And they kind of clear their throat and look at you, and you think, he's going to ask me a question. And I'm doing everything I can to appear socially unappealing. You know. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, what's, it, what's his lying going to be? What's his great opening going to be? And, and it came, as the people were still boarding. He turned to me and said, so, you're going to Hong Kong? <laughs> I said, yes. Yes, 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 yes. That's why I'm on the Hong Kong flight. In fact, we're all going to Hong Kong. <laughs> it's not just me by any means. It's the entire plane is going to Hong Kong. Speak to them. There are 500 of them. You know. anyway, I, I busied myself in my book. I was reading Moby Dick. Eventually, I got round to Moby Dick. And, and he waited for me and said, he said, so, you're reading Moby Dick? I said, I said excuse me, I'm going to the, the, the toilet. So I did. I went to the toilet. And uh, it's the longest time I've ever spent in a toilet, actually. <laughs> 14 hours altogether, and... <laughs> but I did finish Moby Dick. Anyway, I was landing in this, this, uh, on this flight into Florida, and I, there was a woman sitting next to me, and she was a beautiful woman, in her 40s, I, I think she was, and uh, actually, we got talking, she, she, uh, she asked me a question, and I imagined, you know, you do, you extrapolate, I don't know if she was in the media, something in the media, I don't know, or, or the um, uh, design industry or something, I didn't know. And I asked her what she did, and she's a professional pool player. You check her out. Eva Lawrence, she's uh, known as the Striking Viking. <laughs> she's from a, a small town north of uh, Stockholm. John and I were in Stockholm this week. And uh, uh, when she was, I think, 12, she, she was following her brother around this village. Uh, you know, the, the kids do. They follow their older siblings around. And he wandered into a pool hall. And she said she stopped at the door. And she couldn't believe what she was seeing. I said, what? She said, it was like a, a Aladdin's cave. You know, it was fantastic. It was this dark space and these pools of green light and uh, people bowed over these tables and it was like church, she said. I mean, there was this clicking of these balls and these beautifully colors, beautiful colors swirling around the green tables, she said, and they were so intense. And she said she sat there entranced for about two hours and she worked out what they were doing, but they had to get the balls down in a particular sequence. And then she said, the real breakthrough was I realized I had to use the white ball to do it. She said it was unbelievable. And so she started going regularly and she got the permission of her parents to go and she went every evening. In fact, they knew the guy around the pool hall, so he let her use the office at the back to do her homework after school. Then she could practice for a couple of hours. Anyway, she went on to be uh, the local champion. Uh, she took part in the regional championships. She, won she became Swedish national champion, women's champion. She took part in the European champions and won those. And then she moved to America, this is years later, uh, in her early 20s to the world championships where she lost and she said I was kind of relieved in a way because I thought the world's number one would would be a lot better than I was and she was anyway she set up then the first women's pool uh, league which is now an international thing she runs tournaments she uh, she gives master classes she's written books she has had her own tv show she loves it and she said you know I still when I go to the pool table I don't know, I couldn't tell you if I'd been there for 20 minutes or three hours. I, I got so lost in it. She said, the interesting thing to me was, I couldn't stand geometry at school. I, I had a particular thing about geometry, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't get my head around it. She said, but pool is all geometry. When the, pool, when the balls move, you just see new angles opening up and new shapes. She said, I actually use pool now to teach children geometry, the thing I didn't like. And one of the ways you know that you're in your element is that your sense of time changes. You know, if you're doing things you don't like, an hour, five minutes feels like an hour. But if you're doing things you love to do, an hour feels like five minutes. And this is the other element, so to speak, of the element. One of them is aptitude, but the other is passion. It's not enough to be good at something to be in your element. I know lots of people who do things they're good at that they don't like. They're just good at it. One of the, uh, I, I published a book in the early 80s called The Arts in Schools. I don't know if any of you know this book, but uh, it was with the Gulbenkian Foundation. We had uh, a brilliant editor on the book called Millicent. And uh, I asked her one day over lunch, I said, how long have you been an editor? She said, about five years now. Well, she was in her late 30s at that point. 
So I said, well, what were you doing before? She said, I was a concert pianist. I said, well, what happened? <laughs> Bit of a segue, isn't it? <laughs> By the way, this happens, doesn't it? We, we're being brought up with this idea that life is linear, haven't we? This is an idea that's perpetuated when you come to write your CV. You know, that you set out your life in a series of dates and achievements in a linear way, you know, as if your whole existence has progressed in an ordered, structured way to bring you to this current interview that you're having at the moment. And it all gives the impression that we're in control of what we're doing and that our life was not the random series of chaotic events that, that you don't want to present to a prospective employer. Do you? <laughs> you know, my life was uh, a mess right until now, frankly. And, <laughs> I mean, I, I look at my CV occasionally, I think, I didn't plan this. I didn't. I mean, I didn't think when I was walking you know, to the Four Square Temple in Liverpool, if it all goes well, you know, one day I'll be at the Conway Hall, you know, <laughs> talking at the School of Life. You know, you don't plan things like that, do you? I mean, you, you take opportunities and you respond to them. But you take them more willingly if they correspond to your own aptitudes and sensibilities. So I said to um, Millicent, I asked her, you know, why had she taken this well-trodden path from being a concert pianist to being a book editor? And she said what happened was she was giving a concert at the, uh, in the Purcell Room on the South Bank. And... At the end of the concert, she went off for dinner with the conductor. And the conductor said, you were brilliant tonight, Millicent. And she said, well, thank you very much. And there was a pause. And then she said, he said, but you didn't enjoy it, did you? She said, enjoy what? She said, the, the performance. She said, uh, no, no, not especially. He said, do you enjoy it? She said, what, performing? He said, yeah. I said, no, not really. I suppose, not really. He said, why do you do it then? And she said, well, I suppose because I'm good at it. And he said, you know, being good at something isn't a good enough reason to do it. Not to spend your life doing it. And she realised what happened was that she'd been born into a musical family. She'd uh, shown a talent. She'd taken all her Guildhall exams. She'd gone to a musically based school. Uh, she went to the Royal College of Music where she did a music degree. And then she did a doctor music degree. And then she said, as the night follows the day, I progressed onto the concert platform in my mid-twenties. And nobody stopped to ask me if I wanted to do it. And she said, and I didn't ask myself, I just took it for granted that that's what my life was going to be. And she said, it was only when he asked me that that I realised that I didn't like it. You know, my whole life, she said, the thing that I've loved to do is books. I love reading books, I love writers, I love being with writers, I love the literary culture. And she said, I, I crammed it in wherever I could, but I never thought that was an available life for me. And I decided there and then that I was going to do the thing I wanted to do. And she said, at the end of that season, I closed the piano lid and I've never opened it since. And I've lived in the world I wanted to be in. I've been writing and working on books. She said, I've never been happier. Never poorer, but never happier. <laughs> and that's the thing, that being in your element doesn't necessarily entail you know, financial riches, but it does offer you a much surer guarantee of some sort of spiritual fulfillment. And I use the word spiritual advisedly. When I say I have some reservation about organized religion, that's just a personal thing but not about spiritual things. And I, what I mean by spirit is that sense of what animates your life. You know, we use this term all the time in everyday life. We talk about being in high spirits or low spirits. We talk about being lifted up or down. If you're in your element doing whatever it is that you love to do, um, then at the end of the day or the end of the week, you can be physically exhausted by it, but spiritually uplifted. But if you're doing things you don't care for, at the end of the day, you can feel physically fine, but down, and, uh, and needing to lift yourself up again. And in the end, it's about energy. That's all life is, isn't it? It's about energy. It's what stirs your energy, what encourages it, what fuels it, and what takes it from you. And I find that if you're doing things that you love to do, if you're in your element, if you're following a passion of some sort, that you get energy from it. Some activities take it from you, don't they? You spend your life doing something and you feel that it's drained you. But I see people doing things they love to do and their energy levels have risen because of it, because they take energy from the activity. It doesn't drain their energy. And since life is essentially energy, it seems to me rather important that we try to pursue those things for ourselves. And the book is about that. And it's also about the 
importance of creating the conditions under which that will happen. When I talk about there being another climate crisis, I think it's because so many people have denied themselves that possibility. Now, it doesn't follow that you know what this is in your case. I know a lot of people have stumbled across the things they love to do um, and have taken the opportunity when, when it's arisen. Other times, they've been helped by other people who've seen their talent before they saw it. In almost every case, there are mentors, somebody out there who supported and helped you. One of the people in the book, this is a final uh, example, is a guy called Bart Connor. Have you heard of Bart Connor? Bart Connor uh, lives in Norman, Oklahoma. I do a lot of work in Oklahoma these days and um, on this creativity initiative that's happening across the state. When Bart was six, he discovered that he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. Now, we don't know how he discovered this, uh, but he did, and he said it wasn't much use. You know, but he was in demand socially. You know, and he said, you know, whenever there's a party at the house and the conversation stalled, you know, his dad would say, Bart, just do the hands thing there, boy. Would you? And the conversation would pick up again. And then he found he could walk up and down stairs on his hands as easily as on his feet, and he's done it for me. Um, it's a longer story, I can't go into, but <laughs> anyway, he, <laughs> but uh, nobody thought much about this. It was just Bart's party trick, but his mother did. And when he was eight, he said, his mother spoke to the school he was at, and with the school's permission, took him downtown in Morton Grove, Illinois, to the local gymnastics center. And he said, I'll never forget the feeling when I walked into this gymnasium. I said, why? He said, it was like a mixture of Santa's Grotto and Disneyland. I said, really? He said, yes, it was intoxicating. Intoxicating. I said, why? What way? He said, well, there were wall bars, there were ropes, there were trampolines, mats. So it was intoxicating. Well, is that how you feel when you walk into a gymnasium? <laughs> is it? Looking around, not everybody, I feel. <laughs> has this feeling of uh, finding it intoxicating. I don't. I don't find it intoxicating to go to a gymnasium. On the contrary, I need to get intoxicated <laughs> if, I, if, if I get within 50 yards of a gymnasium. Anyway, he went in and he started going every day because it was something he could do and he loved it. Ten years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics representing the United States in the male gymnastics squad. He went on to be the most decorated male gymnast in American history. He lives now in Norman, Oklahoma. He's married to Nadia Komenech. Do you remember her? She was the first perfect 10 in women's gymnastics. They have a wonderful little boy called Dylan, after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? <laughs> we don't know. It's what comes to spending your life upside down, probably, but anyway. <laughs> he and Nadia have their own gymnastics centre. They're leading members of the World Special Olympics movement. So between them, they've helped to liberate the gymnastic capabilities of thousands and thousands of athletes with special needs. Now, just two quick points about this. The first is that Bart's mother could have said to Bart, Stop it with the hands thing. <laughs> Could you? When he was six, you know, like, we get it. We get it. You can do it. Now get over it. And get on with your homework. Do what you're meant to do. But she didn't. She encouraged him. And because of that, he led, went on to have this extraordinary life. But the other point is that even though she encouraged him, she couldn't have known the journey he was about to take. She couldn't have anticipated it, could she? Because life is not like that, it's not linear. When you follow your interests, when you connect with your own true energy, your life takes a different path. New people come into it, uh, new opportunities are created, you affect their lives and they affect your lives. It's a, a process of reciprocity. Uh, something Joseph Campbell said, I mean, his expression is about following your bliss, but he means the same thing essentially, which is if you do that, opportunities open up that weren't there before and that other people wouldn't have had because this is your life that's opening up. You know, I'm sure that Bart's mother didn't think, you know, here's Bart, he's six, 
It can do this hands thing. There's this girl in Romania, <laughs> I believe, you know, and I have a Bob Dylan album. <laughs> it's a natural, it's a natural. <laughs> and the reason is that we create our own lives. We create it for ourselves. It's the gift of human life, that you're not committed to a single course, you can change course, you can create and you can recreate your life and you're more likely to do that if you tap into the thing that you find motivating and fulfilling than not. Um, because in the end it's simply that, it's about energy. It's, um, the last example of this is my, our son went to the University of Southern California and uh, it was interesting to me because uh, it's quite an expensive place. And on the first day, Terry and I went along and uh, all the new students were taken off for their academic briefing. And we were taken off to the finance department <laughs> for a form of grief counselling. <laughs> and we just spent the afternoon tearing up checks till it didn't hurt us anymore. And, but one of the professors there gave a great talk. He said, you know, now that your kids are here, uh, leave them alone. You know, spare them your advice if you can. He said, because you don't know what they'll discover about themselves while they're here. And he said, he gave the example of his own son. He said, when his son had started at USC to about 12 years before, uh, 10 or 12 years before, he said he, he was planning to do classics. He was going to major in classics. And uh, he said, we were a bit worried about that because we thought, what type of a job would you get with a classics degree? He said, so we're really relieved when at the end of the first year of college, he came home and said, you know, Mum and Dad, I'm, I'm think, I don't think I'll do classics as a, ma as a major. He said, OK. He's trying to suppress our enthusiasm for this decision. He said, great. Um, he said, why is that? He said, honestly, I don't think it's going to be very practical. He said, right, OK. He said, he said I think I'm going to do something else that will be more useful. He said, great, what's that? He said, philosophy. <laughs> and, uh, he said, so we pointed out that none of the big philosophy companies were hiring at the moment. You know, they, <laughs> The job market was a bit sluggish in philosophy. And he said, anyway, uh, he went back and he did a year's philosophy, but he ended up majoring in art history. He said, and if I tell you that uh, here we are 10 years later, he has a job in a major auction house, he travels the world, he makes good money, but enough for himself, he loves the life he leads and the people he leads it with, and you know, he couldn't be feeling better about how this has turned out. And he said the reason he got the job was because of his knowledge of art history, his grounding in ancient cultures, and the intellectual training that came with his philosophy program. He said, but if he'd gone into USC and we'd said to him, look, here's the plan. Why don't you do philosophy, art history, and classics? And you never know. Ten years from now, there may be a job in an auction house. You know, it, it could just line up that way. And I say, it isn't that way because of the essentially creative nature of being alive, of being a human being. And to me, it's an essential principle. It's why I argue so hard about reform in education, because our education systems are based on a linear mode of production. And it's, I believe, why so many people end up feeling detached from their own talents, because they've been through an education system that prioritizes certain types of talent and marginalizes the vast majority of other ones. Uh, and if you're not good at certain things, like if you're not good at mathematics, you're assumed not to be good generally. And for me, it's why we have to argue for a transformation in education systems. We're not just that, but also in our workplaces. But it begins with transformation of ourselves. It's something that we came, the view that came, we came to the Vancouver Peace Summit was that you can't, there's something the Dalai Lama said, you cannot promote world peace if you are angry. It's as simple as that. It's Gandhi's point. You have to be at peace with yourself, not complacent with yourself, but at least at peace with your own possibilities. And as Gandhi said, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. You can't promote things of which you are in, to which you are insensitive. It's why so many teachers have a problem promoting creativity, because they themselves aren't in touch with their own creative possibilities, and why that's a bigger hill that we have to climb. But in the end, I think it, it comes back to what Carl Jung said. He said that I am not what has happened to me as a human being. I am what I choose to become. It's the same point George Kelly made when he said that nobody needs to be the victim of their own biography. And as Jung said, you're what we choose to become. 
And as a human being, you're born with a lot of choices. And I think for our own fulfillment, for the fulfillment of the people around us, we should be sure to explore them and make the right one. Thank you.